As we approach our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1181 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The September edition of the Volunteer Monitor Program Report is out. We will have all the details on who has been naughty and nice. Students at a UK school for the deaf have an historic, first-of-its-kind contact with the space station via amateur radio. Scouting's Jamboree on the Air and Jamboree on the Internet is taking place this weekend. Hams in Oregon receive a grant to build out and expand a digital communications network. A brand new interactive amateur radio station will be able to give visitors a taste of life on an island. We will have the details. UN Day is coming up, and the Alexanderson Alternator in Sweden, SAQ, will be on the air on October 24th. The AWRL is continuing its efforts to preserve amateur radio secondary access to the 3 GHz band. And the movie Night, which features amateur radio, had its world debut screening, and we will tell you how you can watch this amazing film put together by young actors in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT, and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how the Internet has changed the way we travel, and he will tell us how the New York Times thinks the Internet didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, will talk about standard information exchange across amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take a close-up look at the VHF frequency allocation battle of the mid-1940s in part one of the special historical look back. We will have a visit from the late Bill Barron, N2FNH, with his segment that was called The Random Access File. This time, Bill takes a look at his introduction to the Radio Shack dual band HTX420 in the way only Bill could relate. We will have the latest report on the current status of parks on the air and summits on the air from Vance Martin, V3VEM. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard. KF9MP will talk about the best methods that he has found to replace rusty bolts on a tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in colorful Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from the studios of the Museum of Science and Technology in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the colorful hardwood mountaintops of the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, located in historic Mount Dora, Florida, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where about 35% of the leaves are off the trees, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where autumn is starting to win her battle with summer, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news is the month's Volunteer Monitor Program Report, which comes to us each month, courtesy of Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, who is the administrator of the Volunteer Monitor Program. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between the AWRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the VM program report for September 2021. Technician operators in Mansfield, Ohio, Avon Park, Florida, and Pulaski, Tennessee received advisory notices after making numerous FT8 contacts on 20 meters. 
Technician licensees do not have operating privileges on 20 meters. A volunteer monitor in Mission Viejo, California, received a Department of Homeland Security United States Coast Guard Certificate of Appreciation for his efforts in locating a defective transmitter on Marine Radio Channel 16 that was blocking emergency communications on that channel. A former licensee in Durham, North Carolina, received an advisory notice for operating under a call sign and license that had been canceled by the FCC. An operator in White Pine, Tennessee, received an advisory notice regarding operations on 7.137 MHz, a frequency not authorized under his general class license. Operators in Sonona, North Carolina, and New Albany, Indiana, received good operator notices for exemplary operation during 2021 and for regularly assisting other operators with transmitter adjustments and amateur radio procedures. The Volunteer Monitor Program made one recommendation to the FCC for case closure. Taking a look at the Volunteer Monitor Program statistics for August showed 2,008 hours on HF frequencies and 2,642 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 4,650 hours. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo Mike. Hotel November. Are you receiving over? Students at the Mary Hare School for Deaf Children in the United Kingdom took part in what appears to have been a world first event for amateur radio on the International Space Station. With more details on this special contact with the Space Station, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Facilitating the direct contact with astronaut Mark Van de Hey, KG5GNP at NA1SS, were Harris UK volunteers and members of the Newbury and District Amateur Radio Society. Students asked their questions orally, and the astronauts' replies, as well as questions and answers posed by the students before the contact began, were displayed in closed caption format beneath a huge video screen. Hi, I'm Harrison. What do you, the northern light look like over, for, from space? Over. In space, the northern lights look like a curtain or a waterfall that's very peaceful in the darkness of night. Um, it looks kind of ghostly to me, actually, but it, it gives me, uh, it's not a scary feeling, it's a very peaceful feeling. Over. The Mary Hare School is an oral school for the deaf that teaches students to develop lip reading skills and to make use of technology. Students range in age from 5 to 19. An enthusiastic audience of some 250 students was in the auditorium where the contact took place. Another 600 in other locations at the school observed the contact via a web feed. Uh, you just made my day. Over. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The ground station used the call sign GB4MHN. Eris UK volunteers handled the technical aspects, while Newberry and District Amateur Radio Society members provided students with the amateur radio experience through events and activities. Leading up to the contact, students at the school learned about radio and space-related topics that touched on physics, chemistry, and biology. Student activities have included designing and flying model rockets, making astronomical observations, and observing authentic spacesuits. Students wanted to know if the astronauts used sign language in space in case something goes wrong how the ISS would be evacuated in the event of a fire, and whether mobile devices such as cell phones work in space. You made my day, Vandy Hay said after all the questions had been asked and the students had applauded. A live stream was available and has been archived. Amateur radio equipment has been on board the ISS for more than 20 years, and most astronauts hold ham radio licenses. 
ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, in a written statement on the newly filed H.R. 5378 before the U.S. House Commerce, Communications, and Technology Subcommittee on Wednesday, urged Congress to direct the FCC to preserve amateur radio's secondary use of the 3 gigahertz band. With more details on the efforts to preserve the band for secondary use, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. A provision in the $3.5 billion budget reconciliation bill would have required that approximately 200 megahertz of the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band be reallocated to the use of 5G vendors. Confronted with the probable delay of the reconciliation bill and an uncertain future for the 3 gigahertz provisions, two subcommittee members introduced similar reallocation language as H.R. 5378. Roderick emphasized that permitting continued amateur radio access to 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz on a strictly secondary non-interference basis would fully protect commercial licensees with exclusive licenses and provide an avenue for continued technological innovation on the part of radio amateurs. Despite vigorous opposition from ARRL and others, the FCC in 2020 ordered the sunsetting of the 3.3 to 3.5 gigahertz band in order to auction the spectrum to 5G providers. Roderick said if the current policy continues, existing spectrum at 3 gigahertz being addressed in H.R. 5378 will be cleared indiscriminately, with ham radio activities being forced to cease for no reason other than regulatory myopia. H.R. 5378 is not yet law, and ARRL's efforts to preserve amateur radio access to 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz on a secondary basis will continue. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. President Roderick's statement was the result of a quick, well-organized response by ARRL to counter the continuing threat to amateur radio's secondary use of the 3 gigahertz band. The Executive Committee and the Legislative Advocacy Committee immediately set efforts in motion in Washington to obtain support for ARRL's position. Meetings were held on short notice to request support with the offices of subcommittee members, including Representatives Adam Kinzinger and Tim Wahlberg, as well as with Representatives John Larson and Joe Courtney. In addition, ARRL Atlantic Division Vice Director Bob Famiglio, K3RF, and ARRL Washington Council Dave Sadal, K3ZJ, met with Chairman Doyle's Chief of Staff on October 1st to explain why it's important that amateur radio continue to be permitted to operate in the 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz band. Despite vigorous opposition from ARRL and others, the FCC in 2020 ordered the sunsetting of the 3.3 to 3.5 gigahertz band in order to auction the spectrum to commercial 5G providers. The commission allowed amateur operations to continue in the lower 150 megahertz of the band, 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz, until it acts in a future rulemaking to address that spectrum. Amateur operations were allowed to continue in the upper 50 megahertz of 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz only until 90 days after the auction, including that spectrum, is closed. The auction began this week. It is likely that operations will have to cease in February or March 2022. A core standard of spectrum policy should be to maximize use of this valuable but finite spectrum resource, President Roderick told the panel. The FCC in earlier proceedings adopted a variety of methods to share and maximize use of the spectrum by radio amateurs and others, but in its latest 3 gigahertz proceeding, it did not do so, despite hundreds of comments filed by radio amateurs. President Roderick pointed out that in earlier proceedings, the FCC adopted methods to ensure unencumbered spectrum access by primary users while accommodating secondary users on a non-interference basis. These methods work well and remain effective without complaint in other frequency bands and also should be applied to the 3 gigahertz band, he said. Primary commercial users would rarely use all of their license spectrum throughout the entire license service areas, President Roderick said. In its recent 3 gigahertz proceeding, however, the FCC went beyond merely prohibiting amateur operations in areas, and at times when primary commission licensees might use a spectrum, ruling instead that all amateur operations in the subband being auctioned must terminate within 90 days of the auction's close. President Roderick told the FCC that it's not logical for the commission to leave spectrum unused before its licensees start using it. ARRL, on behalf of the more than 750,000 amateur licensees in the United States, respectfully requests that Congress take this opportunity to instruct the Commission in H.R. 5378 that radio amateurs' secondary uses should continue to be authorized in the 3 gigahertz band, President Roderick concluded. 
He said there is no technical basis for removing amateur secondary operations from the 3 gigahertz band, where radio amateurs long have used the bits and pieces of unused spectrum for technological innovation. On behalf of ARRL, President Roderick expressed appreciation for the support and efforts of Chairman Doyle and Representatives Larson, Courtney, Kinzinger, and Wahlberg to meet with ARRL representatives on short notice and to include ARRL's position on H.R. 5378 in the committee's hearing record. As we go to air this week, Scouting's largest event in the world, Jamboree on the Air, is taking place October 15th through the 17th. During Jamboree on the Air, scouts and hams around the world, around the nation, and in your own community meet on the air via amateur radio. Scouts of any age may participate, from Cub Scouts to Boy Scouts and Venturers. The participating scouts often gather at a station made available by a volunteer or at one set up just for Jamboree on the Air. Communication typically involves SSB or FM voice, but it's also possible that other modes, such as video or digital, will be employed, or even repeater or satellite communication. Scouts typically exchange such information as name, location, scout rank, and hobbies, and it's expected that many participating scouts will be amateur radio licensees. Contacts may take place across town, across the country, or even around the world. The World Scout Bureau reported that more than 1.5 million scouts from some 160 countries took part in Jamboree on the Air and Jamboree on the Internet in 2017. With no restrictions on age or on the number of participants, and at little or no expense, Jamboree on the Air allows scouts to meet and become acquainted with each other by ham radio. Jamboree on the Air officially starts on Friday evening during the Joda Jumpstart and continues through Sunday evening. Any amateur mode of operation may be used, such as CW, SSB, PSK, SSTV, FM, and Satellite. Jamboree on the Air is not a contest. To learn what Jamboree on the Air activity is planned for a given area, contact the local or regional scout council or contact a local ham radio operator or a local amateur radio club. Your local club may be able to direct you to planned JOTA activities. These can include ham stations set up at Camp Paris or other events. If no activities are planned, work with them to get something set up or arrange to visit a local radio operator's ham shack at a scheduled time to participate in Jamboree on the air. If nothing is currently planned, or if current plans aren't reaching your area, you can work with a council or a local unit to set up a Jamboree on the Air station, or arrange for visits to your ham shack. You can also participate just by making contacts with the many Jota stations that will be on the air. A good resource for finding a local scout unit is the Be a Scout website. Since the first Jamboree on the Air in 1958, Millions of scouts have become acquainted with each other through this event. Many Jamboree on the air contacts have resulted in relationships between scout troops and individual scouts that have lasted many years. Paul Anslow, Victor Kilo 2 Alpha Papa Alpha, reports that the hard work performed by a subcommittee of active contesters, led by the Radio Society of Australia, has finally been realised. The Australian regulator, the ACMA, has announced the release date for the new 2x1 contest call signs. The contest call sign template comprises a VK, VJ or VL prefix followed by one number and one letter. The contest call signs are issued under the following rules. They are issued exclusively for amateur radio contests. Call signs are limited to amateur radio clubs and holders of an amateur operator certificate of proficiency at advanced level. There is a limit of one 2x1 call sign per licensed station, not including repeaters or beacon licenses. Successful 2x1 call sign applicants are not required to obtain a new license or vary an existing license. 2x1 call signs will be issued for a period of 12 months and the call signs will be allocated on a first come, first served basis. The allocation process will commence at 10 a.m. on the 13th of October 2021 by the Australian Maritime College, who are responsible for assessments and call sign issue in Australia on behalf of the ACMA.
Oregon Ham Wide Radio Network, a nonprofit association of amateur radio operators, plans to expand its digital communications network by deploying 12 network backbone distribution sites between Portland and Salem, Oregon. The sites will eventually connect to the Puget Sound data ring, which currently extends from Seattle to Vancouver, Washington. This network will allow emergency management personnel to communicate in the event of a disaster such as a major earthquake. In the hours immediately following a disaster, internet, landline, and cell phone communication is likely to be disrupted. Should such a disaster occur, amateur radio operators will be able to quickly set up network nodes where they're needed to provide emergency communications via the Oregon Ham Wide Area Network Digital Network. Such a mobile or portable setup requires equipment costing less than $100, including an inexpensive Wi-Fi router and a 12-volt battery. It will be a game changer for emergency communications in the Portland area, said Herb Wiener, Oregon Ham Wide Area Network project leader. Funding for the project was provided by an $88,000 grant from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications, a private foundation that supports innovative amateur radio projects such as these. Deciding to fund Oregon Ham One project was an easy decision, noted John Hayes, K7VE, ARDC Grants Advisory Committee Chairman. It's a well-organized and well-staffed project that uses multiple amateur radio technologies, such as the 44-net IP address space, 5 gigahertz radios, and proven software methodologies. It will provide a strong backbone network in Oregon and help preserve our microwave bands. Oregon Wide Area Network is started by members of the Cascade Amateur Radio Society, Washington County Aries, and Clackamas County Aries, all of whom provide initial funding for the project. CARS, Oregon City, Oregon, operates nine amateur radio repeaters and works with many certs, areas, and even church groups to provide emergency communications. Learn more about the Oregon Wide Area Network at http www.oregonhamwan.org. And you can learn more about the amateur radio digital communications at www.ampr.org. Ireland's communication regulator, Comreg, is looking for organizations to oversee the country's amateur radio exams after the current agreement expires with the Irish Radio Transmitter Society on the 21st of December. The Harmonized Amateur Radio Certificate, or HERIC, is to be set, organized, and corrected by whoever enters into the new agreement with the regulator afterward. Comreg is expected to publish its invitation to the tender process shortly on its website. The IRTS has been administering the 60-question Herrick exam on paper. There has been no option to take the exams online. A report on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website noted, however, that the Radio Society of Great Britain has been using a Dublin-based provider for its own online exams. With more details on the latest round of Herrick exams, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting through the Southgate Amateur Radio News. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society in ERA says that the final results for the Herrick Amateur Radio Examination held on the 11th of November were released by the Irish regulator Comreg on Monday the 4th of October. Herrick is the harmonised qualification which is common to a large number of countries and also means that the qualification is recognised by those countries too. 65 candidates sat for the exam, a record number for one day. A total of 43 candidates passed the examination and have been issued with their new licenses. This is a success rate of 66%, broadly in line with previous examinations. The IRTS congratulates them all and hopes to hear them on the air over the coming weeks. It is worth highlighting that most of those who did not succeed this time round failed through a weakness in Part B, the theory section of the examination. The failure rate in this section averaged 33%, compared with 23% for Part A, the Regulations section. This also continues a trend seen in previous examinations. The Examination Board would like to thank the many candidates who contacted them following receipt of their results, to offer their appreciation on the way the examination was conducted and showing appreciation that the Board was in regular contact with candidates in the lead-up to the exam. Places remain available for the next examination to be held in Dublin on Saturday the 27th of November. Full details of the application process can be found on the IRTS website.
The National Shortwave Listeners Club would like to congratulate the successful candidates in the recent examination and are delighted to hear so many new call signs on the air. Commiserations to those that were unsuccessful and they hope to see them all attending the upcoming revision classes in preparation for the next Herrick exam on November the 27th. The National Shortwave Listeners Club have organised a radio field weekend on November the 6th and 7th with a visit to the Shannon Aviation Museum and the Limerick Clare Club Station on the Saturday, followed by their first annual dinner and overnight stay in a nearby Shannon Hotel. The outing will conclude with a visit to the Limerick Clare Club Rally in the Radisson Blue Hotel on the Sunday. Some places are still available and the club also extends an invitation to non-members who wish to attend. You can inquire at info at swl.ie. California's coastal islands are unique ecosystems that have a rich maritime history and wireless communications has played a big role in this history for more than a century. To help educate the public on these unique ecosystems, the Santa Cruz Island Foundation has invited the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club to build an amateur radio station at the new Chrisman California Islands Center in downtown Carpinteria, California. The station will be prominently featured near the center's main entrance. An interactive display will provide an overview of amateur radio communications and the role that amateur radio has played in the history of the islands. When the station is not staffed with radio operators, center visitors can interact with the station using a custom touch screen. This screen controls an interactive presentation on amateur radio and wireless technologies and their importance to mariners, aviators, scientists, and explorers who visit the rugged islands off the California coast. The presentation includes a demonstration of the station's AIS marine vessel, ADSB aircraft, emergency beacon, ELT stroke EPIRB, and amateur APRS tracking stations. Webcams connected to the station via the club's microwave data network will give visitors a real-time look at the island terrain. The presentation will also show how club members and researchers use the information and data collected. Construction of the station was made possible by a $35,550 grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications. According to Levi Mahai, K6TZ trustee, the station is scheduled to open in 2022. The Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club is a 501c3 nonprofit public benefit corporation whose mission is to promote education for persons interested in telecommunications, to disseminate information about scientific discoveries and progress in the field, and to train communicators for public service and emergency communications. Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club also encourages and sponsors experiments in electronics and promotes the highest standards of practice and ethics in the conduct of communications. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Dubai. That's where I was earlier this week. Then before that, Jordan and Oman and Egypt and Israel and Greece. Oh, man. Traveled the world. You know what? You see iPhones everywhere. In fact, technology, you know, it started with television, American television. Uh, I was talking to one of my one of my guides in uh, in Dubai. I like to get a guide, a local guide, take me around, show me the stuff. And, and uh, she said uh, her accent was flawless. And I said, wow, uh, you must have studied in the U.S. She said, no, American TV. <laughs> I thought she sounded a little like Mannix, I have to admit. But she, no, American TV. That's what she said. That's how I learned. And uh, she wasn't the first to say that. I actually had a guide in Japan once who said, I learned how to speak English from the Carpenters singing Carpenter's songs. <laughs> so whatever it takes. I guess he was an older gentleman. Maybe that was from the radio era. She was from the TV era. Then uh, there was the internet. Of course, you don't learn how to speak from that. You learn how to read, though, English and write English. And the, I, t I can't tell you, uh, one of the things that's really changed about travel now, when you travel around the world, English is the lingua franca. It's the language kind of everybody speaks. 
And of course, that's good because as an American, I speak no other tongue. <laughs> this is it. It's, it's American or nothing. And uh, fortunately, they all speak American. So I felt right at home. Thank you. But I think, you know, the next thing, technology, right? Not just internet, but but things like speech assistance, everything that we use, you know, is, is of course, the internet is not English only. And you know that you've, you know, it's occasionally stumble on a site in a different language. It's like, what? Google even translates it for you. By the way, that Google Translate, that's a heck of a thing. As you're traveling around, if you don't mind being a little dorky, you can just uh, press the button on your phone and say, you know, shove it in their face. They speak into that, and they speak, and then it translates it in English and tells me, and then I say, well, thank you very much, which way to the men's room, and then it speaks it and translates that into Arabic, and they, it's incredible. And it, it seems to work. It makes people giggle. I didn't have to use it that much, as I said, because a lot of people seem to speak English pretty well. But anyway, that was a, you know, it's interesting to see how much technology has homogenized the world. iPhones everywhere. Sunday New York Times, today's New York Times, which has a picture of a wet, grumpy cat on the front of it, which is a very funny picture, is, a, is all about the Internet. And, uh, and, the, and the headline is, so the Internet didn't turn out the way we hoped. Hmm. It didn't turn out kind of, but you know, you can't predict how things like this are going to happen. Do you think, uh, the, you know, when the first auto was invented, people knew what would happen from, you know, fast forward a hundred some years and, and, and wow. When, when uh, TV was invented, well, maybe they had some idea of what it would be like or radio, but uh, the internet is, is uh, kind of unpredictable, unpredictable. So this is a, a very interesting piece on, I guess, uh, the idea that the Internet has not not only not turned out as we expected, but it's turned out in ways to kind of negative. This is the trend, by the way. I almost want to buck this trend. The new thing is, oh, everything is rotten. <laughs> we blew it. We screwed it up. Okay, boomers. It's all your fault. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and uh, of course, one of the brunts of this is uh, what used to be the shining exemplar of how everything is wonderful, the technology industry. And now all of a sudden, oh, we don't know oh, Google, oh, Facebook, oh. I was just reading a, a review uh, by a friend, Ron Amadio, in the Ars Technica of the new Google uh, phone, the Pixel 4. And he's just so cranky. <laughs> it's just, it's such a negative review on, on a phone that is perfectly fine. I mean... Did we, for, did we forget what a miracle it is that we have in our pocket? A high-definition camera, a always-connected internet device, the ability to communicate with anyone anywhere in the world instantaneously, to watch TV videos, to listen to audio, podcasts, and radio, and all of this is in our pocket. Did we forget that? Yeah, but it's got a really ugly chin on the... It's, got, it's, it's so expensive. And I don't know. I understand you you know you're a reviewer you got to find the negative in life you got or, you know that's part of the job of the reviewer people often you know hate critics because that's what they do criticize their critics but at the same time let's not forget so here's uh, the article from the new york times the sunday times magazine <laughs> with grumpy cat in a variety of <laughs> unpleasant states muddied it's an illustration i don't think grumpy ever po grumpy's gone now right he's passed away that's a sad thing a cleaner internet if you can pay is the headline. And Kevin Roos, who's a very good uh, tech reporter, one of the best out there, is is talking about an interesting phenomenon, which is as the internet gets more and more junked up with ads and, and spyware and surveillance, the people who will have the clean internet will be the people who can afford it. There is a... Uh, an, an income inequality, a, a, a gap in the Internet experience by people who can pay. Well, I, we were talking yesterday with Scott Wilkinson about Hulu. He said, I don't like Hulu. I have to pay for it and I get ads. And I said, well, you just don't pay enough, Scott. You can absolutely get an ad-free Hulu if you're willing to pay. And ad-free almost anything if you're willing to pay. And, he, you know, he's got a good point. Uh, this isn't how it was supposed to be. In the, in the early days, he quotes Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the World Wide Web. What happened? He said, in the old days, I could email anybody. It doesn't matter whether their account was Facebook or Google. 
But what's happening is people are walling off. They're creating, in effect, a walled, gated community, right? If you can afford it, you're inside. If you're not, well, sorry about your slow internet. Sorry about all those ads. Sorry about... There was a Pew uh, study that just came out this week. They do a lot of uh, surveys of people. And it, was, it had a kind of shocking uh, conclusion that most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, think it's impossible to go through life without being surveilled by private industry and, and government, that there's no way you can, you know, 60% of adults believe they cannot avoid data collection by corporations. 81% think the risks of corporate data collection outweigh the benefits. I have friends who will argue opposite that, you know, there are, you know, with all the benefits we talk about all the time from the internet and even from Google, that there's a lot of benefit. I think there's a lot of benefit. But people are clearly concerned. And I don't know if that's the drumbeat cause. I have a feeling it's not uh, just on. I don't think. I don't know. What do you tell me? On your own, would you just think of this? Or is it that the, the media is always saying, oh, yeah, they're spying on you? Because I'll tell you one thing. And, I, you know, I understand. And you, we all have a, a right to privacy. If it's not explicit in the Constitution, I think we do have a, a right to be private in our lives. I also think there's a benefit to trading away some of that privacy. You know, when you when I arrive at the airport, uh, my Android phone pops up a little notification saying, "Oh, your flight is uh, is at gate forty three, terminal two. It's on time. That's okay, right?" And it knows that because it knows my travel plans because Google, you know, looks at my Gmail or whatever. Yeah, I don't. I, that's okay. What about the next step when it says, oh, no, I know you like a, a Frappuccino before your flight, and there's a Starbucks on your left, fifteen feet away. What about that? And what if Starbucks paid for that placement? What about that? I don't know. Maybe I want that Frappuccino. <laughs> These are the conversations we need to have, but I don't think you want to necessarily say all, all of this is bad, except that this, this drumbeat is going on. They're, they're taking our private stuff. And often uh, they don't have a concrete description of what the peril of that is. That's the other problem. Well, you know, they... They know where you're, when your flight's leaving. Yeah. Well, isn't that awful? Mm, uh, no. Well, uh, someday that'll be bad. The government will come and get you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if I were a fugitive from justice, I might agree. It's bad for fugitives from justice. I'll, I'll grant you that. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think sometimes we overstate the, the bad stuff and we maybe sometimes understate the, the bad stuff as well. I, it, we're, we live in interesting times, the old Chinese curse. We definitely live in interesting times, but I don't think it's all bad or all good. And I think we have, uh, as citizens, probably the duty and, and right to talk about it, to figure out what we want, what we're comfortable with, what we're not comfortable with. I think maybe part of the the anxiety that's going on comes from the feeling that even if we decided we didn't like it there'd be nothing we could do about it that we can no longer count on government to stop google or facebook or you know I, honestly i'm not on facebook i stopped using facebook i decided about a, a year and a half ago i didn't like what facebook stood for and uh, i could you know i can live with the fact that i'm not constant touch with my high school sweetheart and my family second cousin twice removed some people, they say, well, I don't, maybe I don't like Facebook, but I need that. And okay, then there, then there's a problem, right? But I think you have a choice. We're not forced to do this. If you carry a smartphone, you're carrying a pretty good surveillance device. But let's not, uh, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's off, you know, we're getting a lot of benefit. Let's not forget. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. If Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, or Eugene O'Neill had been amateur radio operators, 
One of them certainly would have written a play about the VHF frequency allocation battle of the mid-1940s. For, except for sex, this event had all the elements of a great drama. Power, passion, politics, greed, and sudden twists and turns in the plot were the hallmark of this epic battle. It hastened the destruction of probably the greatest man in the history of radio, solidified the stronghold of another in his quest for total television domination, doomed a viable alternative in the infant television industry, and gave birth to the predecessor of CB radio. Got your attention? Then let's open our playbills and read The Cast of Characters. The ARRL and the 50,000 amateur radio operators. Prior to World War II, hams were virtually the only major users of the UHF spectrum as the frequencies above 25 megacycles were then known. They had the use of the 10 meter band from 28 to 30 megacycles and 5 meters from 56 to 60 megacycles since the late 1920s as well as a small slice of spectrum at 400 megacycles. In the late 1930s, the FCC had allocated two new amateur bands to amateurs, two and a half meters from 112 to 116 megacycles and one and a quarter meters from 224 to 230 megacycles. Except for 10 meters, most of the operations on these frequencies were done with very simple equipment. Modulated oscillators and super regenerative receivers were the mainstay of their activities. For those not familiar with this type of equipment, a modulated oscillator was a tube coupled to a tuned circuit directly on the desired frequency, which was modulated by another tube. Since crystal control and frequency multiplication were not used, the resulting signal varied in both frequency and amplitude when the oscillator was modulated. The only way to receive such an unstable signal was with a super regenerative receiver. Invented by Major Edwin Armstrong in the early 1920s, the Super Jenny was extremely sensitive but very broad-banded. It gave off a loud rushing noise like an FM receiver unsquelched. A complete phone station of this type could be built with only three tubes, an important consideration for the Depression-era hams. Except for limited operation on the 112 through 116 megacycle band in World War II under WERS, or the War Emergency Radio Service, amateur stations had been silent since December 7, 1941. Now, late in 1944, with the end of the war in sight and new VHF-UHF tubes in production for the war effort, the ARRL was making plans for more bands above 25 megacycles. Major Edwin H. Armstrong The unquestioned father of modern radio, Major Armstrong had experienced several setbacks in the 1920s and 1930s, partly because of his secretive nature and uncompromising attitude. He had delayed in obtaining his original patent on the regenerative detector, and, when he did finally apply, he omitted the oscillating properties of the circuit. Lee DeForest challenged Armstrong on this invention by submitting a circuit of his own that he claimed he developed in mid-1912. Armstrong initially won based on the fact that DeForest's design was basically uncontrolled feedback. When, however, Armstrong flaunted his court victory by flying a flag with his patent number on it where DeForest could see it, and when Armstrong refused to grant DeForest a license to manufacture regenerative receivers, DeForest went back to court and this time won. In two separate cases, the Supreme Court ruled that DeForest, not Armstrong, was the inventor of regeneration. This was bad enough, but then Armstrong lost another court battle. Although he had invented the superheterodyne receiver while in France in 1918, it was based partly on a crude, barely functional converter designed by a Frenchman. Despite the obvious superiority of Armstrong's design, the courts ruled against him again. Desperate for a success to reverse these setbacks, Armstrong turned to the idea of FM. At that time, the late 1920s, the concept of FM was known, but it was widely believed that it was impractical, if not impossible. Armstrong, however, proved them wrong, and by 1933-1934 had developed an operational, noise-free, wideband FM system. He offered it to RCA, which had the first right of refusal. RCA, for reasons we will see in a moment, declined to fully develop FM, and Armstrong turned to GE. In Schenectady, he found an ally in W.R.G. Baker, a GE vice president, who saw the potential in FM. With GE's help, 
He continued to develop FM, got the FCC to allocate a slice of the VHF spectrum for FM broadcasting from 42 to 50 megacycles, and set up his first FM broadcasting station, W2XMN, in Alpine, New Jersey. With two other pioneer FM stations, W1XPW in Meridian, Connecticut, and W2XOY in Schenectady, coming on the air in 1939 and 1940, the new Yankee network was up and running. Armstrong was convinced that, once the war ended, FM would completely replace AM as the broadcasting standard, and he wanted a large chunk of VHF frequencies to accommodate it. Brigadier General David Sarnoff and RCA for the first 45 years of its corporate life, RCA was Sarnoff, and vice versa. From his humble beginnings as a telegraph boy and the wireless operator who copied the Olympic wireless signals about the doomed Titanic, he had risen quickly in the Marconi organization and was with RCA from the start. Sarnoff had watched the progress of his old friend Armstrong as he developed FM. However, he had other plans for RCA. Sarnoff was convinced that television was the future and radio was the past. Throughout the 1930s, he had poured millions of RCA's dollars into an all-electronic television system to replace the crude mechanical spinning disc sets that were in the experimental stage. By the late 1930s, he had a viable, all-electronic system ready to go. On April 20th, 1939, at the New York World's Fair, Sarnoff introduced commercial television to the world using the slices of VHF spectrum that the FCC had set aside for experimental television. Sarnoff's interest in the VHF frequencies extended beyond obtaining large allocations for television. He also wanted to minimize the frequencies available for FM broadcast. To him, radio was simply radio an old technology made obsolete by television. He also realized that the public had a limited amount of disposable income available, and he wanted every spare dollar to be spent on TV sets, not FM radios. Sarnoff saw FM broadcasting as a serious threat to his beloved child, and he wasn't going to allow FM to gobble precious VHF frequencies that he felt rightfully belonged to television. William Paley and CBS Although only a supporting player in this drama, William Paley and his CBS network almost changed the course of TV history and, at one point, had both the FCC and the Supreme Court on their side. Paley, through the genius of Peter Goldmark, one of CBS's top engineers, had developed a working color television system with brilliant, lifelike colors more than a decade before the RCA color system was remotely viable. In 1940, as CBS was looking for a way to get past Sarnoff and RCA's stranglehold of patents on their all-electronic black-and-white system, Peter Goldmark came up with the solution. Going back to the 1920s and the mechanical spinning disc, Goldmark developed a hybrid electronic mechanical system. Using the spinning disc, which CBS now called the color wheel, with red, blue, and green filters, he scanned it with an electron beam. On the receiving end, a similar color wheel, synchronized to spin at the same speed, detected the color signal. On August 28th and September 4th, 1940, CBS gave demonstrations of their color TV system to the FCC. The FCC was very impressed with the vivid, sharp clarity of the colors they saw on the screen. By contrast, RCA's color system was an embarrassing flop. In addition to wanting television to start off directly with color, Goldmark was also convinced that the post-war frequency allocations for TV should be on UHF, not VHF. In fact, CBS was so sure that the UHF color system would be the industry standard that they had no plans at all to apply for any VHF TV license. And so, the players in this drama wait in the wings for their cue to come out on the stage. How will they react to the FCC's first VHF allocations proposal issued in late 1944. Who will live past Act One? Who will make it to the final curtain call? The ancient amateur archives with front row seats will have the answers. Oh, hello there. This is Bill Barron, N2FNH. Stand by for the random access thought. Coming up in just a few minutes right here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Okay. 
Connecting to the random access file. I had a Sunday brunch with a remarkable motley crew of ham radio operators. Among the quorum in session were W2XBS, our technical guru here at This Week in Amateur Radio, and Bill Continelli, W2XOY, our maven emeritus of the amateur radio archives. We had convened at a nearby Denny's restaurant in DeFriestville, a little half-mile strip of nowhere, planted right in the middle of anywhere, jammed in smack dab somewhere in wherever upstate New York. Bill was in his best evangelistic form, extolling the virtues of his brand spanking new Radio Shack HTX 420, dual band handheld transceiver, which he sternly advised was on closeout for a mere $129 US. Bill quietly murmured in conspiratorial tones that the very last unit in the area could be located at the Hoosick Street Radio Shack in Troy. The 420 was a cute little blister, reminiscent of the Kenwood THD7A in terms of appearance and keyboard layout. The HTX 420 transmits from 144 to 148 megacycles and from 438 to 450 out of the box and offers extended receive from 136 to 174 and from 420 to 512 plus the aircraft band from 108 to 137. The little HTX might not have been of further interest except that Bill further intoned that this radio could easily be modified to transceive far beyond its respective band edge limits. How easy? This is how easy. On page 42 of the owner's manual, under the heading, Changing the Transmit Frequency Range, the following statement. To extend the range, turn off the transceiver. Then, while holding the scan button plus the 9 button, press power. With this so-called mod, the 2-meter transmit now expands from 142 to 149.88. This is typical Civil Air Patrol and Mars capability, and so no big deal. It was the extended transmit from 420 to 470 that caught my attention, so let's flag that thought for just a moment. This is quite a sea change from previous Radio Shack policies regarding their amateur radio walkie-talkies, especially since when they first debuted their HTX-202. That radio was loudly hailed as a 2-meter-only rig, no extended transmit, no expanded receive. Apparently, this ham-only approach has been slowly tailspinning away from stated doctrine. My ex-wife is a ham, too, and owns a Radio Shack HTX 245. This is also a dual bander. This handy talkie also has a simple two-button mod to go wide band, but the instructions are printed on a dingy yellow slip of paper and stuffed in the box almost as an afterthought. This keyboard approach is also light years away from the days when open-heart surgery had to be performed on some HTs. I still have my Kenwood TH-77A, which had to be physically disemboweled. Some highly significant megachip had to be unsoldered and physically lifted off the primary board just to further unsolder two microscopic surface mount components hidden beneath. Professionals were needed and secured for the project. This was far beyond my own capabilities, but the job got done. Similar devices, such as the standard C-528A, did not require the scary circuit board hospitalization but did offer keyboard mods. However, the prospective owner was required to enter several pages of many press function and many push number in an effort to unfetter and to unshackle. In other words, a major league headache. My uh, now archaic Alenco F1 handheld, which in untimely manner became the F1-2, when my son, about four years old at the time of the incident, smart-bombed a well-targeted shoe onto the surface of the innocent radio and promptly amputated the bright white little number two keypad button, which quickly bounced away and got lost forever somewhere in the flippity jibbity. My other assorted Linkos, well, they, they did make life a bit easier by providing the obvious snip here, bright yellow wire, or the obvious clip here, a bright white resistor, but even so, the protective covers to the transceivers needed to be undone and their soft and secret internals violated. But not so with the HDX 420. At the conclusion of our Sunday brunch with the Motley crew, I decided to take a leisurely tour up street to Troy and sauntered into the Emporium and put forth my request and the requisite cash flow. Five minutes later, I had the booty in tow. I was tempted to change tracks and go with a pair of Motorola T5950 family radio service radios sitting on the shelf, but I held firm 
Which brings us back to my flag thought. This little HDX, by its own design parameters, embraces both the family radio service and also the general mobile radio service. And this little HTX, by its own design parameters, transceives very well in both the 462 and 467 megacycle ranges. Armed with this sensitive little brick of technology, I was now privy to an amazing microscopic world just outside my ham shack window and just right down the street. But the signals, they are so small. And the signals, they are so much higher in frequency that you can just barely hear them outside your window much less right down the street. And the radios that are being used, they are so small that they, like the cell phone and the pager, could easily be dropped into a toilet. So on my own city block where I live, lots of little kids have lots of these little 500 milliwatt FRS radios that you can grab for nine bucks at the Walmart. An amazing and endless chaotic stream of beeping noises can be heard in the late after school hours, playing endlessly between dinner time, homework time, and bedtime. Legal issues aside, I decided to attempt first contact with the preteen street population using the amazing HDX 420 on high power, and much like the CB of yesteryear, lines like Hey Watcher 20 are still very much part of the working vernacular. I immediately met resistance when I asked them what they were doing on my channel. Perhaps I was a bit forward with this unsubstantiated claim. Who are you? they demanded. I am the king, I asserted. You are not the king, they challenged. How can you say that? I stated in self-defense. Because the king lives in Egypt, they argued. But I am from Egypt, I lied. No, you're not, they theorized with obvious knowledge and truth. How can you tell, I wondered aloud. Because you are here in Albany on my street, they assured me. I am the queen, said another, far more adult far more feminine, and far closer to my age. You are? I stammered. Yes, I am a nurse too, she purred. But I was not sure if this was an act of seduction or an offer of mental health therapy. So I put the 420 down and continued to listen to the ongoing drone of the beeps, the boops, and the blips, while the queen called for the king several times more, but to no avail. I did learn a few hours later that the queen had a late night working spouse, who might not appreciate his queen, getting it on with the king. And later that same evening, just a few minutes east of midnight, the king is here, I announced to the pre-squelched static rush and to no one in particular. Hey, man, an anonymous young male voice countered. Yes, I responded with guarded concern. Hey, man, where are the girls? He cooed with an edgy, wicked smile. I don't know, I waffled, caught off guard. There was no more chit-chat to follow. My answer clearly was incorrect, and it appeared that the young fellow may have sharked his way on to another channel in search of the girls. Quite a departure from the kitty talk six hours earlier. But better than cable TV, just the same. Now, far be it from me to suggest that you or anyone employ non-FCC type-accepted RF equipment in the service of the 21st century CB, lest some well-meaning but most likely over-intentioned FRS or GMRS user freak out and spew government regulation dogma out through your speaker grill. But I did have some fun. By the way, I did go back and picked up those Motorola 5950s at the same Radio Shack just a few weeks later. So now when the moment strikes me, I can jockey back and forth between the radios in an effort to keep my cantankerous audience at bay. Should you try this yourself? Only you can answer that question. <laughs> Disconnecting from the random access file. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, has a cautious forecast for radio amateurs. So all eyes are on region 2882 this week as it continues to be a big flare player with potential for radio blackouts. So amateur radio operators, you're going to have to kind of stay vigilant. You're going to have a little bit more noise on the bands this week and you're going to potentially have more radio blackouts. So, you know, on top of your just marginal radio propagation, you could see some issues. 
This past week, ARRL Sun Watcher Tad Cook, K7RA, reported sunspots on every day of the October 7th through the 13th reporting week, although solar activity declined a bit. The average daily sunspot number dipped from 30.7 to 23.6. This is November 3. Victor Echo Mike with your month ending September 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ, CQ Poda, CQ Parks on the Air. And now in Parks on the Air news. In September, POTA welcomed Brazil and Norway to the program, which means we now have parks in 102 different DXCC entities. Activators in Brazil can now choose from over 700 different parks to activate, while activators in Norway, which is rich with nature reserves, have more than 2,500 parks to choose from. In POTA events, coming up on October 16th and 17th is the Autumn Support Your Parks event. This is a great opportunity to get out for a low-key weekend activity and make some contacts before the weather turns cold or for our friends in the Southern Hemisphere as the seasons start to warm up. In our last item of POTA news, we're excited to announce that September of 2021 was an all-time record-setting month for POTA, with more than a quarter of a million contacts made in one month. Although logs are still coming in, the CUSO count is currently at 263,478. And now for our monthly stats update. As we mentioned during our news item, September was the biggest month ever for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 250,000 contacts made by about 1,500 activators. These activators put nearly 3,500 parks on the air from 27 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K4NYM with 3,378 QSOs and KU8 T who activated 61 different parks. The top hunter for the month was KZ4KX with 1,270 QSOs while hunting 943 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Japan was the most active entity outside of North America with 3,779 QSOs being made in September. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Canada, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many other entities. The top DX activators outside of North America for the month were MW0GWG with 978 QSOs and JF7RJM who activated 30 parks. This concludes our September 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Time now for the AMSAT report. Looking to have a little fun on the satellites? Bruce, KK5DO, reports that he's worked TO-108 several times, and it's an interesting satellite. The uplink is 435.720 MHz LSB. The downlink is 435.290 MHz USB. What makes this satellite interesting is that it is on for approximately two seconds and then off for five seconds. That's right, on two, off for five. You basically transmit your call sign and grid square the first time and then hope someone comes back to you. This is one of those situations where timing is really everything. Also, Bruce suggests giving A0109 a try. This one is a bit different. And he says it's almost impossible to make a voice contact. However, CW and FT4 work much better, he said. The uplink is 145.860 MHz LSB. The downlink is 435.790 USB. Now you have two challenging satellites to try. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The CQ Worldwide Phone Contest has a new youth category for people aged 25 years or younger. The annual CQ Worldwide Phone Contest on October the 30th to the 31st and the CW Contest on November the 27th to the 28th are great opportunities for young operators to get on the air and contact DX stations from all over the world. This year is special for young operators because of a new youth category for anyone 25 years old or younger. The rules for CQWW can be found at www.cqww.com forward slash rules.
The new youth category has created a lot of interest, and IARU Region 2 is one of several organisations sponsoring plucks for the top young scorers. There are four plucks, top youth score in South America, for both the CQWW phone and CW contests, and similar awards for the top score in North America in both contests. In fact, youth plucks are sponsored for all continents in both the phone and CW contests. Contests are a good way to introduce young people, licensed or not, to amateur radio's ability to communicate around the world. Unlicensed listeners can log all the stations they hear and compare with other shortwave listener logs. On the air, contacts are short and easy to understand. It's just a signal report, almost always 5-9, and a CQ zone from 1 to 40, so even a mic-shy person can jump in and be successful. If your club has young operators, please help them to get on the air individually or from a club station as a multi-operator entry or invite a local young amateur to join you in your shack. Certificates are available for everyone submitting a contest log, so every score will be recognised. In Region 2, that's the Americas, stations in South America should see good conditions on 20, 15 and even 10 metres, so smaller stations with modest antennas will still find plenty of stations to work. North and Central American stations will find plenty of European and Japanese stations too. So let's take advantage of good conditions to show our young operators how to have fun with amateur radio. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. John Whiskey 5 Juliet Oscar November says that his postponed operation from the Caribbean island of St. Kitts is now back on because St. Kitts has reduced the COVID quarantine period down to one day. So, in addition to his vacation home operation as Victor 47 Juliet Alpha from St. Kitts, he will also be visiting a number of other islands to whet your DX appetite. Incidentally, this will be his first time back to St. Kitts since March 2020. So, here's John's schedule for October and November. John will be going to St. Martin between October the 18th and the 23rd and will be active as Papa Juliet 7 Juliet Alpha. His radio equipment will comprise a Yesu FT891, an Ellicraft KP500 amplifier and dipoles. Activity will be on the 40 to 6 metre bands using single sideband and FT8. And he will move on to St Eustatius between October the 23rd and November the 1st. And he'll be active as Papa Juliet 5 stroke Whiskey 5 Juliet Oscar November. He'll be using the same radio equipment, of course, with activity again on the 40 to 6 metre bands. And then next, John will be active as Victor 47 Juliet Alpha from his Calypso Bay St Kitts vacation home, located 200 feet from the Caribbean Sea between November the 10th and 24th. Fourth. Activity will be on 160 to 6 metres using single sideband and FT8. His equipment at his vacation home includes a Yesu FT1000 MP, an FT450D and an Ellicraft KPA500 amplifier. John says that his antennas are a Mosley Mini 32A for 10, 15 and 20, a 33 foot vertical for 10 to 40 metres, a 35-foot top-loaded 80-metre vertical and a 160-metre top-band vertical, as well as a 6-metre 5-element Yagi. All QSLs need to go to Whiskey 5 Juliet Oscar November direct or via Logbook of the World. John does not accept Bureau QSLs. Foundations of Amateur Radio The art of storing information in such a way that it doesn't evolve into random gibberish is an ongoing battle in the evolution of the human race. Egyptians 5,000 years ago were perfectly happy storing information using hieroglyphs. They used it for well over 3,000 years, but today you'd be hard-pressed bumping into anyone on the street who knows one, let alone 1,000 characters. Latin fared a little better. It's been in use for over 2,000 years, but other than fields like biology, medicine and of course some religions, the best you can hope for is etc, mea culpa and my favourite, carpa noctum, that and a few mottos scattered about. Using technology to store information is no better. If you have a 3.5 inch floppy disk tucked away in a drawer, can you still read it today? And do you know why it's called a floppy disk? What about a 5.25 inch or 8 inch floppy? What about tape? 
do you still have backups stored on DAT? Even if you could physically read the information, could you still make sense of it? Can you open a VisiCalc spreadsheet file today? That was invented during my lifetime, first released in 1979. The latest release was in 1983. My point being that storing and retrieving information is hard. Amateur radio is an activity that has been around since the early 1900s, over a century of information. We describe our collective wisdom in books, magazines, audio recordings, websites, podcasts, videos and tweets. One of the more consistent sources of information coming from our activity is logging, specifically QSO or contact logging. There are bookshelves full of paper log files, but since the advent of home computing, logging now is primarily an electronic affair. If you've upgraded the software on your computer, you know the pains associated with maintaining your log across those transitions. If you've changed operating systems, the problem only got worse. Currently, there are primarily two standards associated with logging, the ADIF and Cabrillo specifications. Both are published ways of describing how to store information in such a way that various bits of software can read the information and arrive at the same interpretation. As you might expect, things change over time, and any standard needs to be able to adopt changes as they occur. How that happens is less than transparent, and in an open community like Amateur Radio, that's a problem. Used primarily for logging contacts, the Amateur Data Interchange Format, or ADIF, is published on a website, adif.org. There's lively discussion in a mailing list, and since its inception in 1996, it's evolved through many versions, incorporating change as it happens, like the adoption of new digital modes, new country codes, and administrative subdivisions. Used for contest logging, Cabrillo is published on the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation, or WWROF, website, which assumed administration for the specification in 2014. It documents changes as they occurred like adding contest names, station types, and contest overlays. While there's clearly activity happening, there doesn't appear to be a public forum where this is discussed. Speaking of public, the DXEC, or DX Century Club, is a radio award for working countries on a list. ADAF stores those country codes using the DXCC country code number, which is part of the specification published by the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League. The list of DXCC entities is copyrighted by the ARRL, which is fair enough, but you have to actually buy it from the ARRL to get a copy. This is a problem because it means that any future archivist, you included, needs access to a specific version of both the ADIF and the then valid DXCC list just to read the information in a log file. To put it mildly, in my opinion, that's bonkers. Relying on external information isn't limited to ADIF. Cabrillo relies on external data for the format of the location field, which indicates where the station was operating from. Among others, it refers to the RSGB, the Radio Society of Great Britain, who maintains a list of IOTA, or Islands on the Air, published on a website that no longer exists. There are other issues. It appears that for the Cabrillo specification, there is no incremental version number associated with any changes. Version 3 of Cabrillo was released in 2006. There are 31 changes published to update version 3, but as far as I can tell, they're all called version 3. So anyone attempting to read a version 3 log will not actually know what they're dealing with. To give you a specific example of three changes, in 2016, the 119G band name was changed to 123G, which was changed in 2021 to 122G. All three labels refer to the same band, but until you actually start looking at the file, will you have any indication about the version used to generate the file? Let's move on. Contesting. Not the logging or the on-air activity, but how to score a contest. What activity gets points and what incurs a penalty? Do you get different points for different bands, for different station prefixes, for low power, for multiple operators, for being portable, and plenty more? Can you make contact with the same station more than once? If so, how often, and under which circumstances? What is the exchange? How does it change, if at all? Each of these choices are weighed by contest managers all over the globe, and they do it every time they run their contest. For some contests, that means that there are dozens of rule versions across the years. To give you some idea of scale, the modern CQ Worldwide was first run in 1948, and there's at least one amateur contest every weekend. 
Now imagine that you're writing contest logging software that keeps track of your score and alerts you if the contact you're about to make is valid or not, or if it incurs a penalty if you were to log it. That software is driven by the rules that govern a particular contest. Some contest software is updated by the author every time a major contest is held to incorporate the latest changes. Other contest tools use external definition files, which specify how a particular contest is scored. As you might expect, that too is information, and it too is in flux, and to make matters worse, there is no standard. So far, the tools that I've found that make any considered attempt at this all use different file formats to specify how a contest is scored, and of those, one explicitly points out that their file format doesn't incorporate all of the possible variation, leaving it to updating the software itself in order to incorporate changes that aren't covered by their own file format. That is suboptimal, to say the least. Personally, I think that there is a place for a global standards body for amateur radio, one that coordinates all these efforts, one that has a lively discussion, one that uses modern tools to publish its specifications, and one that does this using public information with an eye on record keeping. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is helping high school computer science students in San Ramon, California, to become makers by providing a grant to purchase Raspberry Pi computers and Arduino microcontrollers. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here to tell us more in this report from ARRL headquarters in Newington. Computer Science AP teacher Sean Razor said he believes that a hands-on approach is the most effective way for students to learn and retain knowledge. Students will be encouraged to invent their own systems using the Raspberry Pis and Arduinos by combining these devices with sensors, motors, and other electronics and computer code. Students would have the opportunity to learn complex technical concepts firsthand. Razor's challenge has been acquiring enough hardware for all students in his class. The $9,950 ARDC grant hopes to change that. Razor said the results have been extraordinary. The students' creativity and passion for learning truly thrive as a result of being able to bring their own ideas to life, he said. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The class would aim to accomplish this through encouraging students to invent their own systems using the Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. By combining these devices with sensors, motors, other electronics, and computer code, students would have the opportunity to learn complex technical concepts firsthand. The funds from the grant will allow him to provide students with Raspberry Pi and microbit computers, Arduinos, and the other components. Razor plans to transform part of his classroom into a marker space that is accessible to all students at California High School located in San Ramon. The results have been extraordinary. The students' creativity and passion for learning truly thrive as a result of being able to bring their own ideas to life, Razor said. One student, for example, is using a Raspberry Pi Zero and a variety of sensors to record flight data during a model rocket launch. Another has built an automated attendance taker using a Raspberry Pi and RFID sensors. Razor's hope is that these experiences will nudge these students into careers as engineers and scientists. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and internet technology. In 2019, ARDC announced the sale of some 4 million consecutive unused AmperNet internet addresses with the proceeds to establish a program of grants and scholarships in support of communications and network research with a strong emphasis on amateur radio. ARDC, which manages AmperNet, said it planned to provide monetary grants to organizations, groups, projects, and scholarships that have significant potential to advance the state of the art of amateur radio and of digital communications. Members of the BBC's radio club, the London BBC Group, have been granted an exceptional all-year special event call sign to help celebrate the BBC's centenary year in 2022. The regulator Ofcom will permit GB100 BBC to operate throughout the year, starting at midnight on New Year's Day from the headquarters station in Broadcasting House, London.
Operating slots will then be allocated for use by individual members and local groups of operators, from their home locations or from BBC premises throughout the UK. The inaugural Autumn New England Parks on the Air event will take place on Saturday, October 16th, from 0000 to 2359 UTC, the K1 USN Radio Club has announced. The goal is to have one group or individual operator at as many parks on the air as possible. K1 USN Radio Club hopes that this will become an annual event. This is a recreational radio event and not a contest, so no logs will be required to participate. Summaries of activity are encouraged, however, and a post-event link will be available. This began as a reaction to the widespread local interest in the Parks on the Air program here in New England. Last year, Ohio had a successful Ohio-wide POTA weekend, and Wisconsin is now doing something similar, said the K1 USN Radio Club president, Pi Pew, K1RV. Autumn is a special time in New England, and I figured the event might generate some extra interest before winter. Perhaps this can become an annual New of England event, or better yet, an annual nationwide or worldwide event, he said. ARRL New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, is hoping the event will give the public a chance to learn a bit more about amateur radio. He encouraged those who plan to participate to promote the event with informational handouts. Jamboree on the Air, the largest scouting event in the world, also occurs during the weekend of October 15th through the 17th and any POTA participants are encouraged to reach out to local scouting groups. A spreadsheet has been created to keep track of individuals and clubs that register. Contact Pi Pew, K1RV, for more information. NASA has a message for its Deep Space Atomic Clock, the ultra-precise spacecraft navigation aid that's been in test mode for two years. Your time, however precise it may have been, is up. To its credit, the instrument outlived its original one-year test mission that began with the launch in June of 2019 on board General Atomics Orbital Testbed spacecraft. On September 18th of this year, the journey came to an end when NASA turned the clock's power off. Its ambitious function was not without some high points. NASA credits it with breaking the record for stability among atomic clocks sent into space. Hosted on board the spacecraft, the clock had the same mission as its ground-based counterparts, keeping time measurements to aid in the calculations of a spacecraft's journey, factoring in that radio signals travel at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. As spacecraft travel farther and farther from Earth, onboard atomic clocks such as this one are seen as preferable to the current ground-based instruments. Scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory say the clock has one more mission to complete, however. Its data will be used in the development of the Deep Space Atomic Clock 2, another tech demo. Clock 2 is on board NASA's Venus mission, set for 2028. For more than three dozen students at a government school in India's Naganda district, lessons are about to become more than just academic. 43 newly licensed radio amateurs are creating their club on campus and have just received equipment for their shack from the nearby Lamakan Amateur Radio Club in Hyderabad. The Dindi Amateur Radio Club's faculty supporter is Syed Jelani, VU3OND, the teacher who encouraged and coached the students to take the exam for their restricted grade amateur radio licenses. The shack's new equipment, however, is a gift from the Lamakan Club, whose vice president is Ashar Farhan, VU2ESE. Ashar is a well known experimenter and accomplished home brewer whose designs for their microbits open source HF SSB transceiver have brought him global reputation. The club presented the equipment to the student club earlier this month. The students are now QRV with the microbits transceiver, a power supply, an antenna, and coax cable. Calling CQ from a school in their village in Telangana, the students are ready to take on the world. On United Nations Day, Sunday, October 24th, the vintage and historical Alexanderson alternator in Grimmiton, Sweden, with call sign SAQ, is scheduled to send out a message to the world on 17.2 kHz CW. The events of the day will be live streamed on YouTube starting at 1425 UTC. Transmitter startup and tuning will begin at 1430 UTC with the message transmission to follow at 1500 UTC. This year's message was drafted by Swedish human rights lawyer and sustainability expert Parul Sharma. 
SAQ will conduct some test transmissions on October 22nd, 1100 UTC to 1400 UTC, and will be on the air for short periods during this interval. Comments are welcome to info at alexander.n.se. For a guaranteed EQSL, use the online report form, which will be open October 24th to November 14th. Dating from the 1920s, the Alexanderson alternator, essentially an AC generator run at extremely high speed, can put out 200 kilowatts, but typically is operated at less than one half that power level. Once used to provide reliable transatlantic communication, it is now a museum piece and only put on the air on special occasions. The transmitter was developed by Swedish engineer and radio pioneer Ernst Alexanderson, who was employed at General Electric in Schenectady, New York, and was chief engineer at the Radio Corporation of America. Six 400-foot towers with 150-foot crossarms support a multi-wire antenna for SAQ. The actual signal radiates from a vertical wire, one from each tower. Amateur radio station SK6SAQ will be active on these frequencies, 3.535 MHz CW, 7.035 MHz CW, 14.035 MHz CW, 3.755 MHz SSB, and 7.140 MHz SSB. For a QSL, send to SK6SAQ via email to info at alexander.n. Dot se via the Bureau or direct to Alexander hyphen GVV Radio Station in Grimmiton 72 SE 43298 Grimmiton, Sweden. Two stations will be on the air most of the time. For a guaranteed EQSL, use the online report form, which will be open October 24th to November the 14th. The Radio Society of Great Britain is reminding all UK amateurs that to comply with Ofcom's new EMF regulation, radio amateurs need to complete an EMF assessment by November the 18th for transmitting equipment operating on frequencies above 110 megahertz. To assist with this process, the RSGB has made available a new pre-assessed configuration document covering VHF and UHF beam antennas titled PAEC2, Rotatable Beam Antennas for 50 MHz to 1.3 GHz. That document, along with the new version of the RSGB's EMF calculator, which is now up to version 11A, and other helpful information, is available on the RSGB EMF page at rsgb.org forward slash EMF. Due to the low number of essays received, the Intrepid DX Group has extended the submission deadline for this year's Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest to November 15th, 2021. The winner of the 2021 contest will be announced on December 1st. Those who submitted an essay last year are invited to submit again. The prize is an ICOM IC7300 transceiver. The entry rules. 1. Write and submit a two-page essay that answers the question, how can amateur radio evolve to remain relevant in the age of the Internet? 2. Be a U.S. amateur radio licensee aged 19 or younger. 3. Promise to keep the radio for one year and to use it on the air. 4. Send your essay in text or MS Word attachment by November 15, 2021. No Google Documents, please. 5. Alternatively, mail it to the Intrepid DX Group, 3052 Wetmore Drive, San Jose, California, 95148, USA, postmarked by November 15, 2021. All submissions become the property of the Intrepid DX Group and may be published. Contact Paul Ewing, N6PSE, and visit the Intrepid DX Group Facebook page for more information. Congratulations to Florian Barrett of Réunion Island, who at age 10 has received the call sign FR4UG, making him the youngest amateur radio operator in France and its overseas territories. The announcement was made recently by the Amateur Radio Club in St. Louis in Réunion Island following 
Florian's training by Jackie, FR4NP. France only has one class of amateur radio license, and the French HAREC exam contains 40 questions. According to an article in the Outramers360.com website, Florian was inspired to study to become a ham after watching his father get on the air using a citizen's band radio. Meanwhile, although the 2021 online convention of the Radio Society of Great Britain is now over, if you missed it, you can watch the interviews and the other parts of the show on the Pro Society's YouTube channel. With more on this story, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting through the Southgate Amateur Radio News. The Radio Society of Great Britain is delighted that its 2021 online convention was watched by thousands of people across the world, many of whom have since thanked the Society for the excellent content and professional production. Hundreds more have watched the streams since Saturday and are enjoying the 15 presentations. If you weren't able to watch the event live, the two streams are available on the Society's YouTube channel. And you can also see the extra content and interviews that were broadcast between the presentations from the RSGB National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park. The RSGB YouTube channel can be found at www.youtube.com forward slash the RSGB. The individual presentations will be released in due course, so look out for announcements from the RSGB shortly. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. One of the worst tasks we get stuck with from time to time is removing rusted antennas and mounting hardware from a tower. Prevention is just as much a part of this topic as is dealing with rusted bolts. The bad news is there's no easy answer to this problem, but let me share some of the tricks that I've used to deal with rusted bolts. Weather permitting, I go up the tower a week before the job date and oil the suspect bolts with a healthy dose of penetrating oil. And don't forget to warn the ground crew before you start. Also consider where you're parked, upwind or downwind from the work site. I literally flood the rusted bolts with penetrating oil from lots of angles. If possible, one more trip before the scheduled removal date to oil the works is also a good idea. Remember to spray the bolts from below you. Never oil things above your head unless you're wearing eye protection. On removal day, I bring a variety of screwdrivers and wrenches. Bring a selection of locking grip pliers with good teeth. Also, bring two hacksaws with spare coarse blades. Before taking a hacksaw up the tower, check to see if it's that type that easily flies apart when you flex it the wrong way. Sometimes several wraps of electrical tape can stop these cheap hacksaw blade handles from flying apart. Careful selection of cross tip bits can play a big factor in removing rusted antennas. An impact driver is also a great screwdriver bit holder for the bare hand due to its size and therefore increased torque. You can cut mostly through rusted bolts, leaving a thin strip of steel. Then when all bolts are cut, they can easily be broken in fast sequence with a screwdriver or pliers. The other part of the worst case antenna removal is the antenna or mount usually becomes suddenly loose. Consider how you're going to secure the antenna or mount when the last stuck bolt suddenly breaks in half. The use of straps, ropes, or clamps to secure the antenna can help prevent a sudden surprise or injury to the climber and there's nothing that I dislike more than a surprise or injury on a tower. One of the things to avoid is the sudden jerking of the antenna or mount you're removing, as well as the tower you're on. As you plan the job, consider and plan for the slow and easy removal of the hardware. Also, a plan for what will become of the tools in your hands when the stuck hardware suddenly breaks free from the tower. Just as big a part of dealing with rusted bolts is the prevention of the problem, and there are several ways to prevent it from becoming a problem. First, when you buy a new antenna, make sure all the bolts are stainless steel. Even our local little hardware store carries a good selection of stainless nuts, bolts, and flat washers. Zinc plating wears off after time, so only use non-rusting bolts. Coating U-bolts and screws that are not stainless steel with a healthy coating of grease can prolong life and stall rusting for years. This will require annual recoatings to prevent rusting. The brass doesn't rust, but it isn't very strong for holding antennas on towers. And paint can help, but it shouldn't be put on threaded parts. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. 
Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. Using the Raspberry Pi with Ham Radio, a presentation by Jason Allaham. KM4ACK will be available on Tuesday, October 19th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Computers have become an important part of amateur radio. The Raspberry Pi is a low-cost yet powerful computer that can be used for many amateur radio tasks. Jason Olaham, KM4ACK, an avid YouTube content creator, discusses how to use the Raspberry Pi, why he started using it, and why he developed Build a Pi, a script that gets hams up and running quickly. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. As always, the ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change, so check the website for the latest information. Michael Zulu Sierra 6 Mike Sierra Whiskey asks, have you ever thought of stretching your Morse speed skills amongst your fellow amateurs in a way never heard before? Are you ready for the challenge? The idea of the South African National CW Speed Week is to make as many contacts as you can within a seven day period. The goal is to log all contacts on the radar sports log developed by Eddie Zulu Sierra 6 Bravo November Echo. You can find it at radarops.co.za forward slash ZS portal. You'll need to obtain a login pin from Eddie in order to take part, and the pin allows you to edit your own log if you've made an error. The criteria for the week will be CW sent using any paddle or a straight key. Nothing slower than 20 words per minute character speed or faster will qualify you to take part. You will need to declare in the comments column on the logging system what kind of Morse key you used, straight or paddle. The radar system self-generates the points. Two contacts confirmed will yield two points for each, and a contact without a confirmation will give you one point each. So the idea is to make sure that your friends actually log on the online system to gain the double points. During the week, anyone can at any time spot who spoke to whom, either in text form on the radar system or on a bar graph format on the same system. Everyone logs in one place. Just refresh the screen to spot the latest happening. The National CW Speed Week will start at 04 hours UTC on Sunday the 24th of October and will end at 16 hours UTC on Saturday the 30th of October. Remember, logbooks are kept in UTC time. The activity will take place on 80, 40 and 20 metres and you may not work the same call sign more than once on each band. A slow speed equivalent event, the CWQRS week, is in the planning for the very new guys who will use 8 words per minute and not exceeding 12 words per minute. QRS is the Q code for please send slowly. The criteria for the contest is similar to the high speed version and the date for the CWQRS week will be announced soon. Richard H. Arlen, K7SZ of Dacula, Georgia, passed away on October 7th. An ARRL member, he was 75. In addition to other books, Arlen was the author of Low Power Communications and other ARRL publications, and he was an avid QRP enthusiast and experimenter. Arlen had been a radio amateur since 1963. He volunteered in the ARRL field organization as a technical advisor and as an official emergency station since 1990. From 2000 until 2003, Arlen contributed the QRP power column for QST. He has written for several other radio publications, including CQ, Popular Communications, World Radio, and Monitoring Times. He entered amateur radio as a broadcast band and shortwave listener. A U.S. Air Force veteran, Arlen worked for 20 years in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. He and his wife, Patricia, KB3MCT relocated to Georgia in 2008. In addition to QRP, Arlen had an abiding interest in vintage boat anchor gear and had been restoring a Drake 2B and a Heathcote HR-10 receiver. He had planned to install a Halicrafter's SR-160 transceiver and matching power supply and speaker as his primary HF-SSB radio in his shack. 
Arland also was a collector and restorer of military communication equipment. His collection included a TRC-77A Special Ops HF radio and four ARC-5 command set receivers, complete with dynamotors. He procured an ANGRC-103 CIA Special Forces Portable HF spy radio used extensively in Vietnam for backup communications. He held an FCC General Radio Telephone Operator's License. Arland also enjoyed experimenting with antennas, building and using QRP gear, shortwave listening, and CW operating. Try saying CQ again. CQ, CQ, anyone, anywhere, this is KB9RZW. And finally this week, during the Edmond, Oklahoma Amateur Radio Society's ARRL Field Day 2021, Marcus Sutliff, N5ZY, spoke with visitors from John D'Aquino's Young Actors Workshop and learned of their plans to make a short film in which amateur radio plays a role and they needed some help. The filming was to take place in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and they needed someone with film or video experience and someone who could serve as a technical advisor. Kevin O'Dell, N0IRW, a member of the ARRL's Public Relations Committee, became involved in the project and in short order, he was able to assemble radios and props, consult on the script and get ready for a long day of filming. The film's purpose is to give aspiring young actors a chance to hone their craft in a real movie environment. Thanks to the Oklahoma Film and Music Office, they were able to shoot three movie shorts in Oklahoma. In the Camp Hollywood 2021 film night, the young actors mature as the movie progresses. The story begins on a day when the sun mysteriously has failed to rise. One character mentions firing up Grandpa's ham radio. His younger brother reminds him that he once called ham radio the dinosaur's internet, but now it could be one source of help or information. What's going on? What's with the light? Family meeting, come on. Whose family? All of them. But I'm gonna need you to fire up Graham's ham radio. You remember how to do that? Ham radio? Didn't you call it the dinosaur's internet? Not today, it isn't. Okay, come on, Shay. Time to wake the bear. This ought to be fun. Let's go. Get up. Here's the frequency in use. Try saying CQ again. CQ, CQ, anyone, anywhere, this is KB9RZW. Any luck with the colonel? Not yet. The actual internet is down, along with power, telephones, and apparently satellites. All the adults are also conveniently absent. The ending will leave you hoping for Night 2. The movie premiered recently and is now available on YouTube as a 34-minute short. Odell stars as the ham radio voice of Colonel. He and Sutliff appear in the credits, so stay through the end. Odell got a shout-out from ARRL Oklahoma section manager Mark Klein, N5HZR, saying thanks, Kevin, for putting a great light on amateur radio. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. 
If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will.